Welcome to Parker's MMA Show. If you want to learn about all things going down in the fight world, you've come to the right place. Each episode, your host, Parker Keen, will take a deeper dive into the always entertaining world of sanctioned fist fighting. Now, here's your host, Parker Keen. All right, welcome back. Episode 76 of Parker's MMA Show. We have a very special guest on today. Ian McCall, Uncle Creepy, a retired professional mixed martial artist, a true pioneer of the flyweight division in mixed martial arts. Parker, he's a veteran of the UFC, the WEC, and the Ryzen Fighting Federation in Japan. Uh, He's one of the most interesting characters in the history of the sport, and we're very excited to catch up with him. So, Ian, thank you for coming on the show. (laughs) What's going on, guys? Uh, Sorry, I'm just trying to fix fix my internet. Because um, for some reason it's not working. <clears throat> All right. All right. Can you now? Someone's calling me. Can you see me? <laughs> yeah, we got you, man. Okay, there we go. Thank you for the introduction. Um, yeah, I am uh, Ian McCall. I'm the guy you're talking about. Um, you know, I I, uh, I I finally fell back in love with being that person you were talking about. I didn't like that guy at all. Um, the person that I had to become to be, you know a fighter to become the best in the world is fighting. I, I chose the path of becoming a psycho um, and acting out in certain ways and uh, abusing myself in certain ways and, you know, just being crazy. Like I was just, a, I was nuts. Um, <clears throat> and it's now I, I, I work in psychedelics. <clears throat> Pardon me. Uh, I work in psychedelics, which I'm a psychedelic researcher. I travel the world and I do drugs basically. Um, do medicine. I, I just, it's just fun to call them drugs. It makes it gets a better reaction out of people. Um, and my most recent ayahuasca sit in uh, down down in the Mayan Yucatan, the Mayan jungle, was about basically falling back in love. I quit. I finally quit. Like it's long. It's like don't get me to go too far in the story, but I quit during the ceremony. Like I couldn't take anymore. I couldn't drink anymore ayahuasca for the week. I was fucking done. And I had I did the whole no mas thing. I said no mas, and then I had to realize like it doesn't matter. I'm, I I quit. I was a, I was upset with myself and re- realized I, who cares? I haven't fought in three years. I've said I've been retired for a long time and just kind of fell back in love with not with fighting and not having so much negativity towards it because that's that's how I worded it for a long time. And I'm I'm happy that's changed. It's actually nice to hear someone announce me and not go like, Ugh. you know. <laughs> <laughs> so so i was gonna wait to jump into the psychedelic stuff but let's just get right into it so um talk to me a little bit about i'm i'm a proponent of psychedelics i have been for a long time especially when it comes to your career you. and work and you know in your case fighting but um just talk to me in general about kind of psychedelics and plant medicine in general how do you think they can help fighters overall health not only you know after their career but during their career as well Oh man, there's so much to do. I mean, you hear you hear actual science, or I read it at least, uh, science about traumatic brain injury to obesity and um, you know diabetes to depression, agoraphobia, anxiety. Uh, it fixes everything, and you can start off with just healing current or former fighters. Uh, uh, at, at their essence, at their core, you know, dealing with the traumas and addictions that drove them to be a fighter in the first place. You know, you, you want these people to be uh, good role models. Well, you, they need to work on themselves if they're going to be that person. They have to heal those things that made them, you know, made them bad or made them, you know, addicted or whatever you want to call it, slutty. Uh, this is all from childhood trauma. It still affects you that way, just like brain damage. Trauma looks on CT scans, it's exactly the same. Um, you know, then you can actually heal the physical damage. You know, when you're when you're getting TBIs, you're hitting your head. Called a, a process called epigenetic neurogenesis is where, um, specifically, the use of mushrooms, many many psychedelics, but mushrooms is my specialty. Um, it creates epigenetic neurogenesis or neuroplasticity. It, it, it heals your receptor sites, your opioid receptors, your pain receptors, your your, you know, all like I said, it heals all the gray matter of the brain. Uh, the, the neural pathways get healed, new ones get, you know, new ones get built, old ones get fixed. The different hemispheres of your brain are talking much more fluently. Um, 
you know, you, what you're trying to create with a microdose, because uh, that's that's where you get the healing is through microdosing the road, having that the, the, the chemical psilocybin in your brain over a more sustained amount of, of time. Um, and, you know, these things can fix you emotionally and physically. So you see that that can lead to everything. And, and no one's quite talking about it. because I think people just don't know yet. Um, the reason why all of this gets fixed is because psychedelics are anti-inflammatory. And everything in our body that's bad is tied back to inflammation. That's just a scientific truth. Um, and, you know, I don't I, – I, I wish I had more science behind that to explain. Uh, I don't think we even know the mechanism of why, you know, what's – how it's anti-inflammatory realistically. Um, but as, you know, psilocybin converts in your body from psilocybin to psilocin, psilocin is what is called an error. Um, an analog of serotonin. So it looks just like serotonin. It sets off the same receptor. <clears throat> As the receptor gets set off, you have an anti-inflammatory effect in the pathway of the brain. That right there is neural inflammation. That is depression. And there's agoraphobia. That is those sort of the issues. Um, so you clear those up. You automatically see uh, a lightning in your day. You know, um, so that, that was a very long explanation of a bunch of different things. But it does it does a lot of stuff, man. And and to be able to give fighters a chance to not only heal from previous stuff, from further damage, but also perform better. <clears throat> Performing better is was my initial obsession because I'm a world champion in fighting, and I like performance, and I can't fight anymore. So I want to teach young fighters how to do it for me. Um, and you know, it's just it's it's what I should give back to people. Um, and yeah, I mean, the UFC calls me about stuff. Like I set up the Johns Hopkins study that they're doing uh, with psychedelics. Like Dana White gave me the credit for it, which is pretty cool um, because I've been bugging them for like three years. So yeah, it's so a lot of work. Done. Talk a little bit. I've heard you in other interviews, you know, talk about your past with abusing, you know, prescription drugs like Oxycontin, hydrocodone, Xanax, stuff like that. Um, just in fighting in general, how big of an issue is that? And how do you think educating fighters on the benefits of psychedelics, like you know, microdosing psilocybin, could you know eliminate a lot of that? Because uh, this is a grueling fucking sport. I mean, both mentally and physically. And what do you think? You know, having someone like you become the face of that would do for fighting as a sport. I think that it's calmed down a lot because people are realizing, like the UFC actually now tests for that sort of stuff. You saw that used to used to not. They used to not care about it, at least. I'm sure they test for it. Like, I would like to see my old USADA tests, you know, because they were full of all kinds of drugs. <laughs> because there was kind of this thing in the, in the thing, like, ah, oh, like, we don't know. We can't get you in trouble because you're not performing. Um, but I know they changed, like, code of conduct and, and this thing where, yeah, you know, if, if you're going to buy the ticket, take the ride, you should sign up and be the best athlete you can because you have to be, you know, accomplish these sort of things. Follow the rules. Just do them because they're for the, the better, betterment of the sport. Um, my generation and the generation before me were rampant with drugs and alcohol and painkillers and stuff like that. I didn't just abuse painkillers. I was doing heroin and fentanyl. Um, I didn't do meth because I didn't like it. Um, but, you know, cocaine, I just, bleh, meth and I don't get along. Um, and, you know, it was, it was a crazy wild time, you know, to, to come up as basically like the little brother, the little buddy of like the chocolate gel, chocolate gel specifically, but that whole generation, like, you know, I, I, those are all my friends. Like all those are my old, my older friends. You know what I mean? They were like, that guy's going to be world champ one day if he can get his shit together. And I did for a short amount of time. Um, you know, it, it, to be this guy where I know everyone, I look, I know I've been crazy. I know that I was, and we have very obvious reasons why. And I, you can see the person I am now and I'm just showing people look like, I've done a lot of work. If you just you want you want to just yeah do 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 the research and see all the different things that I pulled off in this space and the people that I work with, it's um it's pretty astonishing. You know, I I, I take pride in, in something other than just fighting now. So how do you think introducing stuff like you know microdosing to young fighters would kind of affect the maybe the evolution of the sport? Because obviously it's come a long way from the Tito Ortiz Chuck Liddell days. You know, just technique wise. But um, to offer that at an early age, like if you were to get on microdosing when you were, you know, 18 years old, how do you think that would have changed your career as a fighter? Oh, man, I wouldn't be addicted. wouldn't have been addicted. Um, 
I started taking painkillers when I was 14. Started smoking weed when I was eight. Um, and cannabis has never done me wrong. Um, but, you know, the rest of the stuff. And I, still was, uh, I started taking psychedelics when I was like 12 or 13. Um, they never really did me wrong, but the, but the pills is what really got me. Um, with as creative as I am or was in, in, in training and in the ring, and also with the work ethic that I had, um, I mean, sky's the limit. I don't, I don't want to say, oh, I'd still be champion, but maybe. You know, DJ's still up, but he just lost. Um, you know, I, I know would have accomplished so much more. And the thing is, I say this, I don't mean to brag, but like, because there's a lot of guys out there like me. I'm just a very extreme example of someone who wasn't just good, but showed they're great, but fell from grace, you know, and had a very dramatic fall and just went into, you know, um, it's life. It happens to a lot of people. Um, or at least it happens to a lot of people who are that talented who could be there. I know a bunch of guys. Every city has at least one. Um, you know, like we were just in Vegas talking about it. About, you know, like specifically, you can think of the guy I was talking about in Vegas. You know, um, I, I just I want to be the example of what you can, you know, what you can also do with your life post, but also show guys like, look, these are these are tools you can use where you don't ever have to fall back, and fall into those sort of traps. Because, um, like I was telling you, the, the microdoses are going to heal you from previous stuff. They're going to protect you from current stuff. And they're going to make you more creative. They're going to make your body move like silk. Your breath work is better. Um, <clears throat> mental clarity is through the roof. All of your senses are heightened. That's flow state. If you can get people into a flow state with just a pill daily almost, or whenever they're taking it, you know, depends on their regimen. Um, I mean, just think of the, the, the consequences would be huge. You know, the, 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 that's that's so much more technique built into it. Let's see. Yeah. Um, you know, so much more time to be creative and, and to, to work on flow and not be all you know, bound up, not being, you know, not being creative, not being in the flow. Um, talk about, you mentioned you've kind of in your mind <coughs> made the full transition from, you know, now you're a retired fighter and now this is the next phase in your life. What are some of your personal goals involving the advancement of plant medicine in our modern day society? Um, okay, so... I own part of a pharmaceutical company with Mike Tyson and Daniel Carcio called We Sauna Health. Um, pharmaceuticals killed me at one point. That's what started my whole addiction. Uh, obviously, I should be very against pharmaceuticals, which I am. But if I can create something to be part of a change and create something that goes through the FDA that is a pharmaceutical drug that then <coughs> – sorry, I watered down the wrong tube. Um, I can create <coughs> – um, Something that those same doctors that were overprescribing painkillers to overprescribe this, then I win. <coughs> Jesus Christ. <clears throat> okay. So, <clears throat> all better. <clears throat> and we'll go back to the brain scans. So, think about the two brain scans. Two brain scans. The one on the right is an adult. That adult uh, is, you know, <clears throat> gets a traumatic brain injury doing something they love. You know, they've made their own choices and all this stuff. Now you can see all the brain damage. This other one has the same sort of brain damage. It looks exactly the same, but it's a child. <coughs> that child has been repeatedly abused. You know, so the, the plaque is built up. The damage is built up from trauma as well. It's not just physical trauma. It's it's emotion. It's it's. I mean, a lot of that is physical as well. But you know what I'm saying? That trauma gets embedded in the brain <clears throat> and creates plaque. So you have brain damage. So you realize when people grow up, why are we why are we calling them slutty or stupid or addicted or at least under, we're not at least looking at the root cause of this sort of stuff, you know? So this is the big impact I'm trying to say is if I can help fix the people that were driven to climb into a cage in their underwear and fuck someone up for blood money, that was the driving force in their life. They ended up doing that for a living. Obviously, these people are very very tortured. Um, if I can fix them, because then also think about this, they're, then they're, they're climbing into a cage to give and receive PTSD for a living in front of the entire world on replay. If I can fix those people, I can fix those kids. I can fix those kids. That's the, that's the thing. That's, that's, what, that's what really matters to me because then we're, we're, we're getting, we're, yeah, we're fixing way more stuff. And um, go ahead. 
I was going to ask, just to kind of add to what you're saying, do you think to get to a world-class level like you're talking about, you have to have that just darkness kind of demon inside of you? Yeah, I, I did. You know, it, it's, 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 a, um, it's a predator thing. The, part, the ones, fighters in general are this way. Um, martial artists have that kind of gait to them, but they just the way they walk different, you know? I've been, a, I've been a high school, college wrestler. You know, these are savages. But you get to the highest levels of sport, and we look at everyone else's food. Um, and I, I've caught myself even recently. You know, we get in situations where it's just we just think about things differently. You know, we 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 analyze situations very differently because we're very very dangerous individuals, extremely. And and then, you know, you have to. Yeah, it's it's. <laughs> It's weird to even explain to people because people kind of go, I kind of get it, you know, but um, it's it's really unrelatable for most, I guess. No, for sure. Um, talk about your kind of personal psychedelic protocol and what would you recommend to people, you know, that are getting into it or they're experimenting with different, you know, doses and methods and stuff like that. So if you are your everyday citizen with your everyday trauma, which that's just human life, it's. The path is full of trauma. Uh, it's the human condition. Uh, you can start with one day on, two days on, one or two days off. You can kind of build from there. If you're a person with TBI, uh, with large amounts of of trauma or or brain damage, you know, from hitting your head, uh, you can do my protocol, which is the McCall method: five days on, two days off. You're going to get more healing, obviously, having that stuff in your brain for a long period of time. <laughs> It worked for me, um, and when I started doing it, people were like, that's a lot, dude. And I'm like, it, but is it really? Like, I'm not like you. I'm different. I have a lot of damage, and I also function at a very high level. So you know, I knew I could, my brain could handle it. Um, but realistically, everyone should figure it out on their own. Um, and I, I know people who are taking it every single day and still getting, still having it like there's nothing wrong. It's just as science, as scientific researchers like myself, or real, real, actual scientists, doctors, th they have to take things slow. You know, things have to be kind of like everybody wait, everybody wait. But um, it's happening, you know. So uh, you got to kind of find that sort of microdosing level, not just the level itself, but your protocol for your day-to-day -day work. You're, not, you're, you're never going to do it wrong, people. Just get out there and try it because it's going to make you a better person. It's going to make you more efficient with your life, with work. It's going to make you happier. So um, that's the fun part, too. You get to be a citizen scientist and go do the research. Don't just take it. Go read an article or two so you, so you can at least kind of like know, oh, okay, this is what's happening. You know, it, it'll, 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 it'll work and, you know, it'll come back in spades, I promise. Yeah, for sure. So when I first got involved with it, I, I read a lot into like Paul Stamens and Michael Poland and obviously Joe Rogan has a lot of people on that talk about it. But if you were to recommend some people or you know books or organizations uh, to learn more about this sort of stuff, where would you direct people to? Um, well, if you want to work with me directly, it's the McCall method dot com. Um, go on there. You can book me or just hit me up on my Instagram. Uh, Uncle Creepy and May, which is a name I've been trying to get rid of forever, but it's cost it's like it cost me like five to ten grand to get rid of my name, and I'm like, this is so stupid. Um, <laughs> but uh, if you want information, um, I just came out with a puppet show, and my puppet show is all about psychedelic education. It's called The Puppets. It's on my Instagram. Um, and for information, use the thirdwave.co. That's where we, we source all of our scientific information because we're doing psychedelic education and I'm a moron. So at least, I, at least people think I am. Uh, so I have to I source the information we use on the show to the most credible source we can, which is the third wave. Uh, and then from there, um, you can go to Unlimited Sciences. So Unlimited Sciences was the bridge between myself and Johns Hopkins. And then I'm the bridge between uh, you know UFC and Johns Hopkins. So... It wasn't just me pulling off the study. I had people help me, obviously, because I'm just a guy um, who knows some stuff. You know, like Del Jolly at Unlimited Sciences. Go to unlimitedsciences.com. They've got tons of information, um, really good stuff there. Uh, man, um, if you want to help decrim in your city, or your, your, your area, decrim, uh, decrim Nature, they're incredible. Um, 
you know, th- there's just, I mean, there's so many, so many places to go online. Now to look, Meet Delic is always posting tons of good stuff. If you're on um, Facebook, go to South Orange County Psychedelic Integration Circle. South Orange County Psychedelic Integration Circle. It's wordy because I didn't want everyone being there, but we have like almost a thousand people. I, I haven't posted in a few weeks, but I will post more information soon. There's, there's I mean, months worth of information and articles. Very cool. Uh, I got one more question on this topic for you, and then we'll move to a little bit of fighting if, if that's cool. But um, all right. So in, in addition to the plant medicine, what are some other things that you're doing to both repair your body and your brain after a you know lifetime in the fight game? So number one, um, to repair my brain and my body, we'll say that's free. We'll, get, we'll start with the free stuff. Um, NLP, Neuro Linguistics Programming. Um, mm-hmm. What are the stories I'm telling myself? What are the stories I'm telling other people? These have an actual effect in your life energetically. Um, also, I started off with a smile and a laugh every single day. I'd force myself to get up and get up right out of bed, splash cold water in my face, and make myself smile and laugh. Sometimes it wouldn't happen for a while, but eventually it works. That has an actual chemical effect in your brain and your body. It's free. Go do it. Breath work, meditation. This stuff is free. Um, you have YouTube. You can figure it out. Um, obviously, diet and exercise are huge. Uh, and knowing which exercises do which things to your body and your brain. Running is very, cardio is very, very good for neurochemicals, for depressed, you know, things that are making you depressed and whatnot. Um, working out in general is good for you, obviously. Like, and, and you don't have to push yourself like a psychopath like I do every day. Um, it's not appropriate for everyone. Um, but you know, you, you can get something almost every day going, you're going to be much healthier, eating healthier. Also having an anti-inflammatory diet is huge. Uh, pound turmeric, pound fish oil. Well, not don't pound fish oil cause you might smell like a fish. Uh, take it, take, take the dose, but I mean, take it morning and night, uh, lots of CBD, um, you know, smoke, smoke cannabis or ingest CBD cannabis, psychedelics, they're all anti-inflammatory. Um, then, then we're, then we're starting to pay for stuff. But if you, if you have money, like the way I did it was I started with peptides and microdosing. Uh, well, I guess it started with psychedelics and then, you know, peptides came in later. Um, biohacking 101, you know, peptides is, <laughs> peptides are the best thing ever. I, I've also was working with a, with an exosome company or life sciences company for exosomes, but, um, we'll get there. That's the most expensive. So we'll, we'll, the peptides to start, you have BDNF brain derived neurotrophic factor with NAD plus. Now, <clears throat> I like being surrounded by smart people. My friends are biochemists. They have a peptide lab, so I get stuff cheap. And I don't know. It's just I, I, I got to have the guys who make it tell me about it. Um, this stuff is is so incredibly good for you. And it's, sure, it comes in a needle. You have to stick it in yourself. But I'm not fighting anymore. So I was like, fuck, I'll take whatever I want. Yeah. Um, th- then also tons of BPC. Uh, and, and just BBC 157, but there's a blend of stuff they make. I can't remember what was in it, what's in it. Um, I modulated my testosterone, which is a huge thing with people with brain injuries. Males with brain injuries, like, hey, are you, are you supplementing your, your testosterone? No. I'm like, did you get a check? And some, you know, sometimes they say yes or no, but either way, I'm like, get on fucking TRT. It's going to help you be a lot happier and a lot more functional in life. Right. Um, steroids, steroids are a medicine, not, not just for big idiots. Like, ooh, like, it's not that guy. Like, you have guys that are on TRT that just need it to just just daily function, you know, and that's a lot of a lot of athletes with treat with brain injuries. Um, you have endogenous testosterone. They have they have. I mean, the peptides can go on forever. They get all kinds of stuff. Um, but then if you can get into something like an exosome, who's the, who's the exosome, best person for uh, peptides? Peptides. I use Pixis Labs, Pixis. but like I don't. I mean, I. I I've even asked them, like, hey, who can I write? Can I send people you write? Like, no, they can go through you. And I'm like, I'm not selling peptides. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, like, no, I'll get my own. Um, but, you know, they're, yeah, Pixis Labs, you can get a bunch of them on, online. Just do your research. Um, I, I don't, again, I don't sell peptides, so I don't know. Um, but, <laughs> but, but, and then if, if you have, you know, if you have, if you have coin, look into something called exosomes. Exosomes, it's a stem, they take a mesenchymal stem cell, they enzymatically extract all the DNA, and then you just have a nanoparticle or a vesicle uh, that's, you know, full of, 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 you know, microRNA and growth factors. So the microRNA goes, oh, I need to fix it, plug into this cell, and it plugs in, dumps all the, all the growth factors in there. 
um, it's super good for your brain and body. I've only gotten it once. I got a double dose and I've never felt better. I need one really, really, really bad. They're just really expensive. Um, so I'm trying to work on it myself, but you know, they're, um, they're, that's, that's the whole hierarchy I, that I've used so far. Uh, but it really comes down to personal work and, and, and diet and exercise, man. That's, that's the main thing people have to get on because they can do all the other stuff, all the expensive stuff and get, and not see that much benefit. Right. Yeah. All right. Well, cool. Thanks for talking with us about that. That's something I wanted to ask you about. I'm really super interested in that and the positive benefits for you know me and the world and everyone I know. So uh, <laughs> Billy's, Billy's going to transition here to a little bit of fight stuff. Guy does mushrooms once, Ian, and all of a sudden he's Mr. Psychedelics. <laughs> um, um, so, Ian, I, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, kind of the, the flyweight career that you had is, to me, one of the most interesting stories and journeys in all of MMA. Um, I want to start at Tai Chi Palace, right? Like, you were one of the guys who was a star of this small Indian casino promotion that birthed the flyweight division in North America. Like, can you talk us through how that came together, what that was like from your perspective? And like, kind of now that you've had time to like reflect on it, how do you see the legacy of like Tai Chi Palace in MMA? Like, it's absolutely crazy to me that that's kind of where this was born, but also very MMA when you think about it. Yeah, Tachi Palace is hollow ground for MMA. It's where WEC started and so many different like cool fights that I've seen go down there, man. Um, yeah, I became the best in the world in a parking lot of an Indian casino in Central California, in the armpit of California. Um, <clears throat> you know, I grew up wrestling. Like I, I was, I'm used to Central California, and that just just California in general. And I remember being up there a bunch wrestling. Um, and then got into fighting when I was 18, you know, so this was, this was the place I wanted to go. I was always like, yeah, I, love, I remember, I have so many memories there. Um, I had just gotten out of rehab and I had actually, I had just relapsed. I had my first fight and I relapsed and I died. I ended up in the hospital for a week and <clears throat> Tachi Palace called me and go, hey, we're opening up the 125s. Um, we need you to fight Formiga, the best guy in the world right now. The, the, that's, that's, he's ranked number one. And I was in a hospital bed after I just aspirated and died from drugs. And I was like, fuck yeah, let's do it. <laughs> so, you know, I just kept being sober. Um, that was the one screw up I had, you know. And I, I went back to the gym next week and started training and uh, beat his ass. And then um, I... I, I went on a run there, and the UFC was like Sean. I remember when Sean Shelby called me. He goes, "Hey man, we want to make your division. You keep, you keep. We want to make you the guy." Like they were positioning me kind of as the first lightweight Connor, you know. And I was like, "Cool, I'm marketable. I already know everybody. I have a bunch of celebrity friends. Like this will be easy, you know." <laughs> um, and I'm talented, you know. And I'm, I, I, it was just, it, it was all, it all made sense. I was, it was what I was working for my whole life, and I was, it was also what was told to me my whole life was going to happen. You know, so this just made sense to me. Um, and I started picking people off and beating people up in a beautiful fashion and showing the technique and the beauty of it. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, man, that was, those were good days. Those were really good days, really good nights. Like just, just being a part of that, that, you know, being the people that brought it into the UFC, like, yeah, sure. I mean, people are making real money now. Um, but that's not really why I did it. I mean, I, once I got to the UFC, all I saw was dollar signs, you know, but like at its essence, no, I'm a martial artist. I did it to be the best in the world. So it was, it was cool to kind of have that nostalgia to it um, <clears throat> and to be the people that ushered it in. Whether, whether you want to look at my UFC careers, I mean, it was a shit show. It was kind of embarrassing. Um, but, you know, it, it, it started off good, I guess. <laughs> Do you view it that way? Do you look at your UFC career, like as you described it, like a shit show or a failure or something like that? or do you just kind of say like it was what it was and it got me to where I am today? Um, well, I have that outlook. That's where it got me. But it was a shit show. It was embarrassing, you know, and I'm not mad at it anymore. I find I find humor in it and I I find love in martial arts again. And what I, I, you know, that was a big part that same night when I had to say no mas. I fell back in love with fighting. I fell back in love with just being about what happened. The life I lived was amazing. You know, it was just my own personal 
demons that I couldn't uh, I couldn't deal with, you know. And they they, and of course the situation I was in only exacerbated my issues, you know, my addictions to women or to drugs or to just to dopamine as a, as as a whole. Any sort of dopamine response I can get, I'll do it, you know. Um, yeah, it was it was a uh, it was a wild ride that I wouldn't take back. We'll put it that way. Sure. And I saw you tweeting about this the other day, but that wild ride ended in Japan, right? In Ryzen. Um, what was that like? What, you know, we, on this side of the, uh, this hemisphere, right, in North America, we just don't have a lot of visibility into that organization. We've obviously all heard the, the stories of how wild Pride was, but what was that like? You know, what is it like kind of fighting in Japan? How is it different from your experience with the UFC and the WEC? Walk us through what that was like for you. For the notoriety and for the, the love of the fans, I mean, it was pretty unparalleled. And it was very, very incredible the way that they treated me out there. My results were garbage, obviously. That we don't, <laughs> Those two fights were bad. Um, I, you know, I got the rope cut me to my, you know, my, my forehead opened down to the skull and then I got knocked out in one punch. Um, that's not, you know, the, the results that I wanted, obviously, but I was also snorting Oxycontin in the back in the bathroom before I fought. Like, what did I think was going to happen? I already knew that ship at sale. I was trying to cash some checks and, um, yeah, it was, like I said, it just wasn't a graceful exit either, but at least I knew with that knockout that I was over. I knew I couldn't. I knew I'd pro- if I if I would have taken another big TBI, I probably wouldn't be here today. So that being said, like, what do you make of all of these guys who you fought on cards with or fought with, kind of coming over to UFC, Bellator? You know, thinking about like the Manel Capes, the Kyoji Horaguchis, even the even Jerry Prohaska who. You fought, you know, on the same card as him. What do you think of these guys? Kind of what is what is the ceiling for for each of those individuals? Um, where is, is this Hor- Horiguchi and Bellator? Horiguchi. So they have a fighter exchange, right? So he yeah. is he is going to get the next. You know, whenever he's ready, he gets a crack at the bantamweight championship. And I'm sure COVID has kind of messed some of that up. But yeah, okay. Um, um, I think that they there's you know. Manel has fallen flat. He's a talented kid. He is. Um, but he's just, I don't know if it's the pressure or what it is. Um, maybe he was taking something he's not allowed to take anymore. I, and I'm, I don't mean to, that, that don't mean a steroid, just anything that's just affecting him <clears throat> with USADA. Because obviously he wasn't some Hulk before. I'm just saying, who knows? Um, and most likely it's psychological. Um, I think Horiguchi can go out there and shine and smash those dudes. Um, you know, the, the Serb, he, um, he's, he's proven how good he is, you know, like, and he, he's crazy. Like that's, I'm, I'm literally at my, my, you know, ex's house. She's Serbian. I love Serbian people. Um, I almost married, I almost married one. Um, you know, they're good, good people. And uh, I'm excited to see, you know, the savagery of that land, uh, you know, dude, just working in the UFC. It's cool. There's a lot of tough people in that area, man. Um, and like along those lines, like, what do you make of this current crop of flyweights? Are you one of these guys who sits there and is like, you know, these guys wouldn't hold the candle to the guys I fought in that tournament against, or is it a situation where you're like, you know, evolution. these guys are, are really good. Oh, it's evolution. They're really good. And I watched that, <clears throat> that, um, Figueredo and, uh, Moreno fight. And I was like, yeah, yeah I can fuck these dudes up, you know, like it without, I like, get a bar fight. You know, like I'll beat your ass in a bar fight. You know, like I don't need to train for this. Let's just let's just go man to man. You know, I I don't know if I can make it through training camp. That's what I'm getting at. Uh, <laughs> has has jujitsu and everything has passed me by. I still do jujitsu uh, when I can, uh, but yeah, it's passed me by for sure. Um, do I think I can still compete in the UFC? If I I put serious effort into it, yes. But again. My body would never hold up. It wouldn't. It wouldn't. Like it, I couldn't. I couldn't make a fucking training camp. I, I was punching pads. I was hitting pads. This is my bad hand. You know, the one that's everyone. All the surgeries. Um, my buddy out in Vegas. The day, I was in Vegas doing comedy. And he goes, "Let me hold pads for you." I said, "Okay, yeah, yeah, whatever." I put pads on. I hit him for like one round, and didn't feel a pop or anything. But I have so much damage in this thing 
that now I think I broke my hand again. Just because I was like, dude, really? Like, fuck. So that just, I mean, I hit my shin on someone's cauliflower ear and I was out for like a week or two. Because my, sh- my, my, the, the legs that carry me to kick the fuck out of people forever. Like, I love kick. I, I, I'm no, never happened again. But I think on a technical level with my brain, um, obviously that's still sharp. That's still at a level that's really, really sharp. Or if not sharper than ever, and, and, and analyzing why, uh, wise. So I think that, um, you know, if I had a different meat vehicle, I could I could beat these these boys up real bad. Do you have any interest in coaching? With that being said, you have such a great mind for the sport. You've always been a super technical guy. Like, does that interest you at all? Uh, I do coaching with psychedelics. Um, that's part of my the McCall method. Um, right now, I'm not really currently working with anybody. Um, <clears throat> I had to take some time off and just uh, we had a bunch of business stuff going on. Like we had uh, the pharmaceutical company I'm part of. We went public on the tenth. Uh, the company I'm actually working for is going public by the 31st. Um, so just a lot going on. Um, but I, I would eventually love to, when I could find some time, I would love to coach. I would. This is just like, you know, if I, could, if I could still take off, you know, three hours every morning to go to the gym and hang out with my friends, you know, and, and, and that would be great. <laughs> So that being said, like, what does your day to day look like now? And did having a daughter kind of change that day to day? I had her when I was world champion. Um, yeah. and I raised her by myself for the first few years. So that that she just she's just in the fold. She's my she's my road dog. Um, <laughs> you know, like, yeah, she's nine now, and she's like she met a boy for the first time. Well, shit's gone crazy. Really. I saw this. I heard, I heard there's a uh, neighborhood dad who could have uh, Uncle Creepy at his door pretty soon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, like, <laughs> and I, you know, my, my daughter's extremely beautiful. She's looking like her mother more and more. Her mother is insanely pretty. Um, I know what I'm up for. I know what's going to happen. I know, like, and I'm just kind of just going like this. And just, I, like, I realize I'm not a hot chick. I've, I've only, I've only chased them my whole life. You know, like, I don't know how it is to be, I don't fear anything. No one can hold me down and have sex with me anytime they want. You know what I mean? Like there's crazy shit that women think about. So like, I just go, all right, like, I'm just going to be here and just look intimidating. So hopefully no one fucks with anyone. Um, but you know, kids have to live their life and it's, it's, uh, it's, (laughs) it's getting crazy. You know, she's, she's, she's basically raising me. You know, so like I, I feel like she's an adult already. It's weird. So now you're what, 36 years old now? 37. Just 30, 37. 37. All right. So 37, Ian McCall, what is your best advice to your 20 year, 20 year old self? Oh, change the drugs you're using. Go use psychedelics. That's all I have to just keep this crazy ass mindset because um, you're going to need it. You know, you're going to need it and you're, you're going to be a pioneer of a sport that's savage and, you're, you know, your body's going to break because, you know, certain things you've done in your life just weren't uh, obviously one way or another not being healthy enough and I'm blowing my arms out, my shoulder, out, four surgeries here and three surgeries here and both knees and my hip and, you know, like there's just, it, it would have helped me be a much different, uh, different athlete. For sure. Um, what is your best advice to the next generation of fighters? Take psychedelics. <laughs> I, I, I drugs. Don't, I don't. Yeah, I do. Go do drugs. Um, <clears throat> do, do them with me. Let me guide you through it. And I'll make sure it's done the right way with the right people, the right guidance, the right integration. Um, because the human condition is the human condition. And these medicines fix it. I don't want fighters to stop fighting. I like watching fighting. I like being a part of it. I don't want this to go away. Um, these people go, they can take a bunch of psychedelics. They're going to turn to pussies. And I'm like, no, they're going to be better. Never mind. You, you just don't get it. <laughs> you don't get it, man. Uh, you know, so, yeah, just for them to do that work, to do the spiritual work, it doesn't even have to be with medicine. You can do it through meditation and yoga, breath work. These are tools I use as well. They're really, really powerful. Um, if you believe in Jesus, if that's your thing, then, you know, you can – you can find your enlightenment through it, but just just use it for the right path. Don't be a, don't be a fighter. Be a martial artist. That's the biggest thing. Don't be a fighter. Be a martial artist. 
All right, that leads me to my next question. What in your <clears throat> mind makes a phenomenal martial artist? Um, and obviously there's attributes they have in the ring or the cage um, that surpass everyone else. Um, but that's not even it. I mean, you can be a martial artist and, and, and be your average person. You know, your average type of, you're still going to be better than average, but maybe you're not that physical type of person that can even hurt people or, or protect people. You know, like I've, I've, tr I've had clients who did martial arts their whole lives that are so physically inept still that you're just like, okay, you're just not that person, but you're trying, at least you have the philosophy in your mind. Um, martial arts is about, this is what I teach the kids when I used to teach kids, kids classes, it's about how you carry yourself. I'm giving you a set of values and strengths that you can use to protect other people. That's what, that's what martial arts is for, is for protection. Um, so I'm putting it on you. You're in my class to where you need to protect other people. I don't, I don't, you know, I never want a kid to get hurt, put themselves in harm's way. But you've seen that little picture of that little boy who got eaten, got chewed up by that pit bull saving his little sister. And you see the picture, you see the, you see the picture of them and the way she's holding on to him and looking at him. And you're just saying, this kid's just, his face is ripped up and he's just posted up like a man. You know, just this, like, this protector. And that, that's that's what I expect from my kids. You know, I, I don't want anyone to get hurt, like I said, but those opportunities arise. You're the one that runs into danger to help other people. What What is the most lasting lesson that you've learned personally about from martial arts and how will that carry into your next phase of life? It taught me sacrifice. I don't know why that word's coming up. <laughs> I do, I guess. It's the sacrifice of myself, not only for others, but the sacrifice of certain things to take for granted in life or that maybe you don't need. Life is supposed to be simple. Um, you know, and sacrifice isn't always a bad word. You know, it can be used in, in a good way. You know, you're, you're, you're sacrificing things for good. Um, you know, just, just because as a martial artist, you're trained to be tougher than the average person. You know, you're the one who can make those sacrifices. I think that's a big part of it. Awesome. Um, all right, my last one for you, and then we've got a little rapid-fire segment. But um, in your mind, what is the biggest problem with modern MMA, and how would you fix it? Oh, the biggest problem with modern MMA is judging, for sure. Um, and I have a solution. Judging and scoring. So <clears throat> there's something called the Scoring Senate. ScoringSenate.com. <laughs> I own part of it. Um, my friend Steve came to me. He works or was working for Microsoft. <clears throat> um, and he made some technology where, you know, it, it's we're bringing, we're getting rid of, of your judging and your scoring eventually. We still have to figure out the actual process of how I want to do the scoring. I'm thinking like an abacus, like all the different section, you know, sections of fighting, and you get how many points you can win, you know. Uh, but again, I, haven't, I'm, I don't know. I'm not good at math. Um, but as far as the judging portion of it, we get rid of the judges, and we have what are called senators, <clears throat> a panel of MMA, of legitimate MMA fighters. We get to judge these people. And there's an app. So every single scoring you know, judgment we make is stuck on there forever. And if, if the world doesn't like it, we have to explain why. We get held accountable. Um, so there's, you know, we're trying to further our own sport. We're trying to do these young people good. And I'm getting fighters paid to do it. Um, you know, it, it, it's in, in essence, it's in theory, it's a very good plan. Um, we, we obviously, we can review show, old shows and talk about it and kind of hone our craft. Uh, but there would be a lot more, almost like a certification process that they'd have to go through to, to really make it work on a, on that sort of level with with an actual commission. Uh, but right now, it's it's a fun thing we do, you know, is trying to bring back judging and scoring to fighters themselves because we know more than Adelaide Bird does, you know, <clears throat> like you know people like her in there, or, you know, in general. There's not just her, there's a bunch of people in there that have no business being judges in boxing or MMA or kickboxing. So it's like, you know, if we can go back to the people that deserve it, the people that should be scoring it is the elders of the sport. You know, I got, I got Boss Rutten and Rashad Evans and Chuck Liddell and I mean, Frank Trigg and I mean, uh, Dean, Dean Thomas, Eves Edwards, the list just goes on and on and on, a bunch of women, 
Angela Hill, Heather Joe Clark, Carla Sparza, like legitimate fighters, you know, um, to get on there and then do their opinion. And it, it'll be more than essentially it would be more than just like three judges. It'd be like, a, you know, a, a, almost 10 of them or whatever. I'm not sure the number yet, but it'd be more like 10. Um, so then you'd have a, a, a better, better understanding of who won, who, who lost. Do you think they would have to be there live or is that something you could do, you know, from wherever? Mm-hmm. Or? No, no, no. We, we pay for their, um, their pay-per-view and uh, they do it from their home, from um, the app on the phone. <laughs> all right Ian uh, every guest we have on the show we do something called a rapid fire segment um, five questions just like a five round fight of you know first thing that comes to mind we try and keep it to theme to every guest and try and keep it away from MMA so I know uh, I know you're trying to get away with it from it but uh, I have a rapid fire of creepy things for Uncle Creepy here okay, so um, let me know when you're ready and we can start going with it shoot I'm ready all right, question number one. What is the creepiest animal you or someone you know has kept as a pet? Uh, I caught a baby possum in college. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I came home all fucked up one night, and I just was like, oh, and I saw it out where, like, the cars were, and I grabbed it, check it out. And I walked it inside. We named it El Wapo after Boss <laughs> Rudin. And, uh, yeah, we kept it for, like, a week or two, and I, I was, we were trying to train it to kill – my my other roommate's bird because the bird was an asshole um, but that never happened it got fleed it got in my bed it didn't eat so i had to put it in the pound or wherever the, sh- the shelter the pound <laughs> i put it in there like there's, a, there, there's a depository <clears throat> awesome yeah um number two what is the creepiest movie you've ever seen oh, man what was that um what movie was that? There was I, I I don't I'm not afraid of anything. I've never been afraid of stuff as a kid. Um, but there was this one movie back when you know Shane Del Rosario, my best friend who passed away, a big heavyweight. We did everything together, and we're watching this movie. And I remember he was next to me, and his 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 girlfriend's daughters were next to him, and you know we're sitting there. I got so scared of this movie. That I wanted to climb in, in next to him and cuddle with him because you know we're best friends. We grew up together. We always cuddled, um, you know. And I was like, I, I felt so tempted to get up and go sit in his boot because it was like one of those big luxury theaters with the big chairs. But one of the girls ran up and jumped in there before I could, and I was I was so frightened this whole time of this movie, dude. I can't remember. And this was like this was my daughter's nine, so it was probably like seven years ago. <laughs> I got so frightened, dude. It was horrible. Question number three, what is the strangest or grossest thing either you have eaten or someone you are with has eaten? Strangest or grossest thing I've ever eaten. Oh, you know what? Blood pudding. Filipino blood pudding. Um, With my old training partner, Romeo Danza, who's, you know, a little Filipino guy, world champion, 112 pounds. One of the best kickboxers the the, the, the United States will never remember because he was at 112 pounds. Um, and you know, we go out and I would always eat with like a bunch of different Asian cultured people and a bunch of different, different types of Asians at the gym. Um, so I was always eating a very different, very wide variety of food and I go eat with him and I tried it and I was just like, no, 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 no. I'll eat anything, but I'm not into it. Like, I don't like it, but he ate it. And then we went and trained after and we were clinching. And while we're clinching, he's burping in my face, blood pudding. And it was, it was the most disgusting shit. Oh, my God. (laughs) Question number four, Ian. What is something, not necessarily that scares you, but creeps you out, like kind of gives you the willies personally? (sighs) Not spiders, but spider webs. I don't like spider webs. They're just, you know, they get on you and you don't know. And then last question for you here, Ian. I know you're trying to get rid of it, but if you were to give the Uncle Creepy nickname to another human being, who would that person be? Are we allowed to pass on nick- nicknames? I hope so. Um, man. I don't know. I, don't, I mean, is there, are, there, are there creepy fighters right now? I wouldn't want to get on anyone. The name is, I didn't want this fucking name, okay? <laughs> I put it down as a joke when I just got out of rehab, and I thought it was funny. Um, and then... 
like management in the UFC. Everyone got a hold of it and they ran with it. And I was like, fuck. So no, I don't want to give that name to anyone. The name is stupid. <laughs> All right, real quick, Even give us a, give us a little story about how that came about because that was one of our questions we didn't get to. <clears throat> I am not creepy. Okay, I might be weird, but um, I was trying to put my friend's son to bed. You know, I was again being fresh out of rehab. Uh, I was sober, and everyone else was, you know, out partying all night. And he's awake at like three in the morning. Uncle creepy, uncle creepy. It's uncle Ian, uncle Ian, uncle Ian. And uh, mind you, I always made fun of everyone with nicknames. I'm like, "Oh, you're the Ice Man. You're gonna freeze me," you know. Like, <laughs> and I'm, and we're actually at Chuck Liddell's house, <laughs> and I'm going to put him to bed. And he goes, "Uncle creepy." And everyone sat up, and they were like, "That's it. That's your nickname." Well, I didn't know if I was ever going to fight again. I was, like I said, fresh out of rehab. Like, I don't know. It was a joke. I wrote it down, and then everyone loved it, and now it's stuck there. And I, I don't know. I, I've always thought it was stupid, but whatever. <laughs> As a fan, Ian, I think it's absolutely hilarious. So, well, um, you. Uh, you know, you got you have one at least who loves it. Um, <laughs> That's all I have for you, Ian. You know, I really appreciate you coming on the show. It's, you know, a, a longtime fan. It's so great to hear that you're at a great place in your life, seemingly. Like, that means a lot to me personally, uh, as someone who's followed your career. Um, let us know kind of where, let the people know, I guess, where they can find you on social media and your website and everything like that. And then if you have any shout-outs, now's your time. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so uh, social media is... Uncle Creepy MMA. My website is the, the Um Those two places are where you can contact me. Um, if you want to see the work we do, we did an episode of HBO Real Sports. Um, you can see it on there. Pretty sure it's still up. And or you can find it online. It's it's, it's not not hard to find. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, just go out and um, do some psychedelic research yourself. You know, don't just take it, but go read an article or two and. Uh, and, and figure out how to, you know, have the best time possible before you do it. Or, you know, like I said, reach out to a professional. They can help you because these, these medicines are um, need to be respected. And, and uh, they're pretty awesome. So thank you for having me very much. Thank you very much, Ian. Best of luck, brother. See ya. See ya. Texas Trees is the premier tree care company in the DFW area. Whether you need basic maintenance or specialized services, when it comes to trees, we've got you covered. Pruning, chipping, bracing, and cabling, even root barriers and disease control, we do it all. And if you aren't sure what you need, we have certified arborists on staff to point you in the right direction. Visit us at NorthTexasTrees.net. That's NorthTexasTrees.net. Thanks for listening to Parker's MMA Show. Take a moment to rate and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts and visit Parker Keen's MMA Show.podbean.com for additional information on Parker and to stay up to date on the latest drama in the fight world. For more information and important links about today's episode, check out the show notes. <laughs>